One of, one of the things that I've learned in my life and, and in ministry is that if you stop moving, you die. Like, it, it's something that is, is living is always moving, is always growing, is always changing, is always adapting. And once that stops, you begin to die or, or, or decay. And here's the thing. God wants us to keep moving. So, so this morning, what I want to do, um, probably actually very briefly, because my voice is not going to last, is I just want to, I'm going to preach and talk about uh, moving in a direction, not only as, as a church, but for you as individuals as well. Because God wants us to keep moving. He doesn't want you to stop moving in your life. In fact, our mission statement, what we believe here at KCC, is that we exist to lead people to take their next step in a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe that every single one of us, myself, every one of you out there, has a next step to take in your relationship with Christ. And, and that next step is going to be life-changing for you. God will not allow you to stay right where you're at. And if you're following Jesus, maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for 50, 60, 70 years. You know what? He doesn't want you to just be saved. He wants you to keep moving and to keep growing and to keep being made more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. And today, listen, if you're not here, I mean, if you're not here, like you're watching me on camera. Uh, hey, welcome, welcome to the people that will view on camera this week. That's great. Um, but, but if you're here and you're not yet a, a, a believer, not yet a follower of Jesus, that you're in the right place today because he wants you to take your next step in a life-changing relationship with him. You being here, in fact, today, uh, may be what that next step what was, was that he was asking you to do. Jesus always invites us to something better than we have. But we have to move. You know, I, I've told this story before, um, but, but to me, it's, it's just so true. Like In church world, uh, things are... We've got things messed up so often than, than, than the real world does. Like if, we, if we went to a, a hotel and uh, we saw a 42-year-old man um, like, like me, and I was sitting in the, the pool, and I was sitting in my floaties, and, and I was kicking my legs there, and, um, and, and say, what's, what's up with that guy? Oh, he's been coming here for 40 years doing the same exact thing. You know what you wouldn't say? You wouldn't say, oh, he's faithful. But in the church, that's what we say. You've been coming here for 40 years, and you haven't changed, you haven't moved, you haven't adapted, and what we do is we call you faithful. In the world, we call that ridiculous. God wants us to keep moving, to keep changing, to keep growing, to keep adapting. And that's true as individuals and true as a church. I'll be 42 years old on Easter, and, and listen, and I'm just getting started. There is something inside of me that will not let me stop. I have a difference to make. There is something inside of me that when I see lost people in the world, that I have to reach out to them, that I have to go share the love of Jesus with them. There is something inside of me that's saying, hey, you know what? It's time to take the next step. It's time to move on. It's time to go further. And I'm so excited about it. But here's the thing, we have to move. Those changes aren't gonna happen in our life if we just sit still. Those changes aren't going to happen in our life if we don't put forth the effort. Those changes aren't going to happen in our life if, if the world doesn't look at us and say, you're ridiculous. We have to move. You know, I, I was just thinking about some big moves in my life, and this one was hard for me to think about. Do you remember what it was like uh, if you're married to be single? Like, I don't, I don't really remember that a whole lot. I got married when I was 19. Um, but really, what, what I remember was, like, I just wasted a whole lot of time. Like, you didn't have to ask for, for permission for anything. If you wanted to go to the movies, you, just, you had money, you went to the movies. Like, it, life was completely different. Um, I, I was thinking about it in college. Like, do you remember how delicious ramen noodles tasted? <laughs> Crazy. Like, I remember being so poor, like, that, that I would take Jennifer on a date to the mall when we were dating because we could get free samples in the food court. <laughs> like the move was difficult to get married, but, but it was worth it. And then I went from being a husband to being a dad. Whew. That was a big move. Because your kids call you out. And whenever I do anything wrong, like my kids call me out. Like they remember a cuss word I said when they were three years old. 
Or every time I'm speeding, they're the ones that are saying, hey, you need to slow down. You know, it's difficult when, when you make those moves. Because oftentimes we just think that, man, where we're at is the best that it's going to get. Like where I'm at right now in my life is the best it's going to get. But listen to me, our God is bigger. He has more for you than you could ever imagine. If you always do what you've always done, you're always going to get the same results. If you always do what you've always done, you're always going to get the same results. That's in our individual lives, and that's in church life. So I believe that God's calling us to three movements in Jesus Christ. And, and the first one is this. It's just come and see. Now, you can see some things in, in your life that, that will change you just by seeing them. Like when my wife walked out on our, on our wedding day, like that changed me. When my kids were born and I got to see them, one, two, three, um, that changed me. Being able to hold those little kids in my arm like, and see what God had given me, that changed me. Like, I remember my first mission trip. When I saw poverty in a third world, it changed me. And I said, you know what? Something's got to be done about that. So I started going to, to Mexico every year, and I started going to Guatemala, and I started going to Honduras, and I started going to, to Costa Rica. Because... Poverty will change you when you see it. And when there's got to be something done about it. You know, one of the things that God says is, hey, you take care of the poor people. And we look around in the United States, and listen, I know some of you don't have much, but you don't have any idea what poverty is until you've seen it uh, in a third world country. And God says, you've got to do something about it. You know, when I got into ministry and saw that the, the, the state of the church and that churches are dying, uh, 150 of them each and every week will close their doors. I heard this stat at, at, at Ozark a couple of weeks ago when I was at the preaching, teaching convention, that before I'm done preaching today, 150 churches in the United States will close their doors. By the time I'm done preaching next week, another 150 churches in the United States will close their doors. And that changed me. And I've said it before, I, I went from being the preacher that was all about just trying to make all of you happy and, and trying to keep my job to being the preacher that was going to be on fire and passionate about doing what God's called us to do. And if you run me out of here, that's fine. because God's going to take care of me. You know, when I saw the uh, plight of women who were being sexually trafficked all over the world, it, it changed me started an organization in Costa Rica called Broken Chains to, to bring about restoration and, and rehabilitation to women who are stuck in human trafficking. You know, when God tells us to come and see, he's inviting us to come and see his power and to come and see an opportunity for him to do something great in and through us. Because listen, it's not about me. Holy moly, I'm just a hillbilly kid that grew up in Harrison, Ohio that, that really doesn't know anything. I'm not even very well educated. But when we're willing to stop and say, God, I want to see what you want me to see. I want to be the person that you want me to be. God is going to do incredible, amazing things in and through you if you're willing to just simply move. Come and see. And a few things I think that he's asking us to come and see. And if you're trying to follow along in your bulletins, I'm sorry because I've changed this sermon 14 times since Thursday when I printed those. But let's come and see. God's saying, come and see what, what God has done. Like, come and see what God has done. I heard somebody say this. They said, when you feel hysterical, get historical. When you feel hysterical, get historical. Like, because when we freak out and it happens, when we could become afraid, when we can't see what God is doing, you know, maybe we can't break the addiction. Maybe, maybe the job isn't going well. Maybe the marriage is falling apart. Maybe the kids are rebelling. When we are loaded with fear and anxiety, what begins to happen is that we begin to get hysterical. When what we should be doing is, is begin, begin, be getting historical and remembering everything that God has done and how he's been faithful in the past. It's an invitation to come and see what God has done. Psalm 66, 1 through 6 says this, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. 
Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. There's an invitation to come and see what God has done. And that was, in Psalm 66, that was a reminder to the Israelites of God's faithfulness in the past. And when they for, would forget, when they would begin to focus on the enemy, when they were uh, in, in exile in Babylon, when they had no homeland, God was always telling them, hey, listen, remember all that I've done for you in the past. Remember how I delivered you from Egypt. Remember when you were enslaved under Pharaoh's hand and I set you free. Remember how you walked across dry land through the Red Sea. Remember how I fed you in the desert uh, and, and you didn't have any way to get your own. Remember how I provided water to you when you thought you were going to die of thirst. Remember when I knocked down the walls of Jericho and you were able to march into the promised land. Remember all that I've done for you when you feel like your life is falling apart and there is no hope. Remember. You know, I, I was thinking about that. I remember nine years ago when I wasn't sure uh, even that I was going to stay in ministry. Uh, I had a uh, church in Kentucky. Uh, they decided, hey, we're not going to move anymore. And, and it broke my heart. I thought, man, I just don't want to work with church people anymore. Like, I, 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 was, I was ticked off at y'all. I, I didn't even have a resume uh, written the day I resigned. I hadn't even talked to my wife about it. I thought, man, I'm just done with ministry. Done with that. And I remember coming to, to KCC here. Like, good week, we're, we're getting 100 people. And I remember when we didn't have this amazing multi-purpose building back here that we just built. I remember when finances were, were tight. I remember hearing all the other preachers around here say, man, I wouldn't take that job at Ken Mundy for $10,000 a week. So when I start to panic and stress and get filled with anxiety over what's next, I remember God's promise. Like, this is the only time that I think biblically that, that looking backwards is actually moving forward. Like, I remember how God provided for me. I remember when I was scared and, and didn't have a job and wasn't sure what my next job was going to be, that God put me at KCC. I remember how God put Howard Craps uh, in place a year and a half before I got here to bring about healing and to set the tone of leadership so that when I stepped in, that we were able to, to move and grow and, and allow God to use us. I remember how God opened doors for us to get involved into the community. I remember how God raised up staff uh, for, for this church. When I remember how faithful God has been in the past, then I rely on his promises for the future. Like, come and see what God has done. He also invites us to, to come and see what he can do. Not only what he's done, but, but come and see what, what he, God can do. You know, when you remember what God's done, it's, it's a whole lot easier to believe what God can do. And I want to see God do more. Like, we've seen just this year... Our average attendance go up by 50 people every week. We've seen people's lives changed. We've seen people move from death to life. We've seen addicts be set free. We've seen marriages be restored. And here's the thing, I'm praying that we see God do more. Like, I believe God's done great things, and I believe he wants to do more. Um, John 1, 43 through 50, and I love this story. Um, it's when I preach our core values, it's what I talk about all the time, this story. But it says, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael. Found people, find people. Once we've been found by God, one of our core values, once we've been found by God, the natural response to that is that we're going to go find people. We're going to, to lead them to Christ. Uh, it said, the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Verse 46, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. Just come and see. That's all. Nathanael, just, just come and see. If, he, if he's bogus, if he is just some, some joke, 
some clown, then you've wasted nothing but a little bit of your time. But if he really is the Messiah, it changes everything. Nathaniel, just come and see. You know, I wish we had more of that attitude in, in our church. Just come and see. You know, I, I know inviting people to church is intimidating, and, and it's scary. And that's why we do our very best to create an environment where you can just say, hey, come and see. That idiot on stage every week is going to tell you about Jesus. Just come and see. Come and see. You know, I have theological discussions with people every week, and, and I'm asked questions every week that I don't know the answer to. Why do bad things happen to seemingly good people? I don't know. What I know is, in reality, none of us are really good without the grace of Jesus Christ. Why are some people born into to poverty when other people are born into wealth? I have no idea. I don't understand why God allows tragedy to happen. But I know we live in a broken, fallen world where tragedy is a reality. And I just say, hey, I don't know all the answers. And sometimes I still struggle with doubt myself. But if you'll just give Jesus a chance, if you'll just come and see what God can do, he will change your life. Verse 47 it says, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree uh, before Philip called you. Some of you today, you're going to feel exactly like that. Exactly like uh, Nathanael. Like, how could God know me? I feel so insignificant. Um, nobody knows what I struggle with. Nobody knows my fear. Nobody knows my addiction. Nobody knows how depressed I am. Nobody knows that, that I, I thought about taking my own life this week. How could God know me? And if God does know me, if he knows all those things about me, he probably hates me. And all I would say to you this morning is come and see. Come and see. Because I think you'll be surprised how Jesus will treat you. You have in your mind probably the image of the way that the church has treated you for so long. And listen, that's not how Jesus responds to you. He'll not kick you when you're down. John 3, 17, Jesus said this, that the Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Test that out. Come and see. So then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. You will see greater things than that. Come and see what God can do. See God restore your broken marriage. See God bring your rebellious child back into fellowship. Come and see God set you free from, from addiction. Come and see God save your friends and family members that you thought would never enter the doors of the church. But you have to move. You can't sit still. You can't expect God to do all the work if you're not willing to get up and move. But you will see greater things. Third thing I think that, that God is calling us to come and see through Jesus is come and see the empty tomb. Come and see the empty tomb. This validates every other claim that Jesus made. Because listen, if the tomb isn't empty... Like, we're all wasting our time. If the tomb isn't empty, I'd be sleeping in on Sundays. If the tomb isn't empty, you should be on the lake or at the ballpark this morning. If the tomb isn't empty, then we're here for no purpose at all. Just like, come and see the empty tomb. Paul wrote in Corinthians that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, we should be pitied among all people. In Matthew 28, 1 through 7. It says, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled the back of the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. 
The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see. If you don't believe me, just look inside. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, and there I've told you. When they saw the empty tomb, they had faith that they would see him again. And that's how it works in our spiritual lives. When you see the risen Savior, when you see the scars in his hands and the hole in his side, when you see that he has risen, you'll have faith that you'll see him again. You'll have faith that he'll be there when you need him. You'll have faith that there's more to this life than just accumulating a lot of stuff. There's something greater ahead, and you'll keep moving. Come and see. And that's why with two, going to two services, we just want to create more opportunities for people to come and see. Because we believe that Jesus really did rise from the dead. We believe that Jesus really is the hope for the world. We believe that whatever's going on in your life right now, Jesus is the answer to that. And one of the things that, that I want to just close with this morning, it's kind of the second invitation that's listed in your bullets, and we're not going to get to the third one, but it was this, come and die. Jesus said, come and see. And then he said, come and die. And it's a little counterintuitive to how it goes in, in, in the U.S. Like, we don't like to talk about death. But that's the truth of the gospel. The way for us to live is to die. Like some of you, you've been trying to get your life straightened out. You've, you've read books. You've gone to the gym. You, you bought a new house. You, you bought a new car. You, you got a better job. You're making a lot more money. You, maybe you've gone to counselors. And I'm not saying anything of the, any of those things is bad. But the problem is that, that you're not a bad person if you don't know Jesus. The problem is you're a dead person. Jesus doesn't want to just make bad people good. He wants to take dead people and make them alive. And the only way for us to live is to actually die. I'm just going to close with, with Romans chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 1. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You know, my sin was placed on the cross with him. Your sin was placed on the cross with him. It says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. See, the death he calls us to, the death he invites us to, brings about life. It says, for if we've been united with him in his death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. Like I'm not a slave any longer, I'm a son. And it's so much better being a son than it is a slave. It says because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Today, I'm just gonna ask you to move. Maybe today, for the first time, I don't know what your move is. Maybe your move today for the very first time is to die to self and be immersed in baptism and be united with Christ in that way. Maybe today your move is, is what? Maybe you've been coming here for a long time and you've, you've never made the move to be, become a member and to be actively involved in, in the church here. Maybe that's your move today to come forward and say, hey, I'm ready to, to be a member. Maybe today the move that you need to make is just say, you know what? I've been struggling with this and I need to repent of this in my life and I need to give it over to God. I don't know what your move is today, but I'm gonna ask you to stand and as our worship team leads us in this last song, Stronger, I said, I just want you to be confident that God is stronger than whatever you're dealing with. God is stronger than, than, than the pain that you face, than the depression that you battle, than the trouble that you're in. That God is stronger. And if you need to move today, I'm just going to ask you to do it. Father God, I'm thankful that you've called us from death to life. Thankful that you 
speak into our lives at the time that we need it most. Father, today I just pray that as individuals and a church, that you will give us direction and that we will be willing and, and, and obedient to keep moving as we follow you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.